It's another edition of the Blue White Breakdown, but not just any edition. <laughs> another special guest. Last week we had Ray Dittinger. This week we have an enormous personality, uh, a man who's been my friend and confidant and, and pretty much, uh, I guess, um, what would you call him? Almost like my agent in this business for quite a while. He's a good man. <laughs> And he knows about a lot of stuff, but Bob's going to go crazy this week because he knows a lot about horse racing. <laughs> He's Dick Girardi, formerly of the Philadelphia Daily News, still the uh, color analyst for Penn State basketball, which is an, an entire other realm of full of tradition and pageantry. <laughs> Dick, how are you? Dave, uh, nobody like Dave uh, in the world. A great introduction. And I guess Jonesy has certainly been my confidant. I've tried for years, Bob, to help him, and he just won't listen. <laughs> I know, I know some of the stories, but we don't, we don't need to get into that. But they're all in fun. They're yes. all hilarious. Dave's a good sport when it comes to some of the stuff you guys yes, talk about, and I just enjoy any and all inside info, <laughs> inside baseball. Love it. Plus, you love the horses, and I do. You adore this man, but you you yes. always keep asking me to add. I said, well, why don't you take his number and call him yourself? Well, yeah, you add, you you all talk right. to him all the time. Well, you, you, ask. You, got, you got the inside path, Dave. Yeah, you but it's got like the it's inside like inside path. It's like asking you know John Oliver to translate uh, figure skating information. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea. So you could speak yeah. the lingo directly to him. It makes no sense. You know, I just think that. Penn State fans who are listening and watching to the watching this, um, if they're not familiar with Dick Girardi, um, I, in all in all sincerity, I think the the best. Sorry, Dave. The best college basketball guy that I, that I've read. And also the greatest uh, horse racing uh, writer that I, I've had. The, he's just unbelievable. Another one of those Philadelphia Daily News guys. That staff is just, I mean, you know, a, a good a good staff might go three or four writers deep. Good, talented guys. That's the staff was like 12, 15. Everyone, it was like Murderer's Row. Anything, at, at this, any topic. This is going to end up like Chris Farley, where we do all the time. Yeah, Paul McCartney. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Dick, when, when do you think we met? Do you remember meeting me? When do you think we met? It had, had to be Penn State football, I suppose, right? You know, that, that would make sense, Dave, or maybe basketball. Tell me when you got to the Patriot News Penn, one year. Penn State basketball? You didn't know it existed. Not, until not, like, not, not that, like a big five game or something. Uh, when, did, when was your first year at the, at the Patriot uh, News? In 90. I, I started so, showing up in yeah. 90. Probably. How about an Atlantic 10 tournament maybe yeah, at the yeah, Blast or something like Blaster. that? At the well, I think I, that was where I made, I think I made my first famous line today, which he often quotes to me. I said, Dave, you really don't know that much, do you? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was much later than that. Much, much later. <laughs> but, now, now, David, I, but yeah, sometime I would say in the early 90s and then but, when Penn State – started in the Big Ten for football. That was the first year I started covering the football team. So Dave and I obviously saw each other fairly regularly at that point. And we were, we were catching up this morning. I did not realize he uh, covered – Dick covered Penn State football for quite a while, from 93 to 04. Is that what you said? That is correct. Yeah, some, uh, obviously some great years at the beginning and then some <laughs> not so great years <laughs> at the end in the 2000s. As usual, everything you touch – <laughs> crap. I'm uh, never good. I'm ne I'm never good at endings. I'm good at stories, but I you know I mess up the ending somehow. Uh, you were mentioning the '94 team because I had forgotten. Uh, you, you were taking road trips and everything with that team, right? Yeah, I, I think I went to a, a lot of the road games. Now, keep in mind, we did not have a Sunday paper, so it wasn't as obviously with the Eagles, it wasn't a huge deal, but it was a deal. At our paper, and I specifically remember the first game of the year was at Minnesota. I was not there. It was fifty six to three, and I'm thinking, you know, this they might be pretty good. I got to interject a, a quick yeah, go ahead. because yep. I've got Murray Warmath. Do you know him? Yeah, the sure. Former Minnesota coach. Okay. Yep. And yep. he's he's beside himself because it's thirty five nothing at half. <laughs> and and he's got a bunch of his old Codger Codger buddies behind him in in the Metrodome, and he's going. You know, well, they 
They, they won't call the holding. And one of his buddies says, <laughs> Murray, it's 35 to nothing. And he said, oh, but still, you know, and they go, go ahead, go ahead. So the second game of the year is at Beaver Stadium. They're playing USC. And this is a true story. They're up 35 to nothing at Again. halftime. So I go up to the press box and call my travel agent and make plane reservations for the Rose Bowl. That's how they were, they were like, just, oh, my God. Yeah. How good is this team? And, and it was obvious real early that they were going to be one of the all time great, certainly offensive teams in the history of college. Yeah. Football. And you made the road trip to uh, Illinois. Is that what you said? I did. That was the last road game of the regular season at Illinois. Uh, they'd had that bizarre game, remember, the week before against Indiana where they mm-hmm. they were crushing them. Then they put, uh, Joe put the subs in. They gave up a couple of late touchdowns, and people that didn't watch the game misunderstood what had happened. 35-29. 35-29. Had, had been 35-14. Right, uh, and they'd actually run back a fumble touchdown. for a yeah. touchdown to make it 42, I think, and they got called back. But anyway, right. people that's when they, they'd already dropped in the polls to number two after beating Ohio State 63-14, to 14, <laughs> which made no sense. But, yeah, the Illinois game, so, Bob, you'll love this. It's 21 nothing Illinois after the first quarter. No, so I woke up kind of the top of the press box, and Dave, my good buddy, looks at I'm me. Seeing him up there. Seeing that's him up. it. Yeah. They're in trouble. They're, you know, I, I said, Dave, let me ask you a question. Have you been watching this team all year? They will <laughs> score enough to win. The question was, were they ever going to stop Illinois? They finally did. And won 35-31 and, of course, had the great drive in the last minute. Brian Milton scored the winning touchdown. But that was, to me, the signature moment because they hadn't been in close games. The only other close game they really had was the Michigan game out at Michigan. And when they needed to show, hey, they could do it under pressure, they did all right, so who wins, Penn State or Nebraska? They never played. This yeah, it's it, instructive to Bob, I think. It, yeah, I don't even think it would have been close that year. Nebraska's great team was the following year, the 95 team that just obliterated Florida uh, in the national championship game. Nebraska didn't have a very good offense. And, Dave, you'll also appreciate this. While I was overlooking the Pacific Ocean in my palatial room in Manhattan Beach the day after the Rose Bowl. Uh, it, Joe had his press conference, and I remember asking him specifically, because he always said, wait till the end of the season. And I said, is this the best team you've ever had? And he said, look, I can't imagine any team that could beat it. So I went back to the room and called your friend and mine, Tony Sinisi. I said, all right, neutral field, Nebraska, Penn State. What's the line? Penn State minus three. That told me all I needed to know. Penn State would have been favored in the game, even though they finished number two because everybody wanted Tom Osborne to win a national title. Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty much true. And they, they Miami almost beat them the night before. I mean, it they was did. And Miami wasn't very good. They weren't yeah. very good at all, and they yeah. almost beat them. They almost yeah. Beat Nebraska's them. offense was very pedestrian that year. They had a great defense. And of course, the next year, I mean, they were awesome. That was one of the great teams in college football history. The '95 Nebraska team. Uh, I guess we have to get into a little bit of Penn State basketball since we're on a Penn State thread. Yes, we can do that. Uh, I remember you getting, you know, you missed really all the glory years. And ever since, I mean, it's been a hard (laughs) road for Dick Girardi. It's been a hard road. As James Johnson used to say, uh, (laughs) Dick, it's hard. It's hard. (laughs) (laughs) My buddy James Johnson, who left Penn State to go to be an assistant coach at George Mason, and his first year ends up in the Final Four. Final Four. Final Four. No problem. No problem. Those first few years, you know, you got in at the very wrong time. You, what was it, 02, 03 season, right? My first first year was first. Yeah, my first year was Ed, yeah, it was oh four oh five. My first year was Ed's second year. Ed DeCellis' second year as the head coach, and the the first three games were in Milwaukee, uh, in in where the, it's not where the Bucks play, it's where the Bucks used to play. And the third game, they lost to South Carolina State. I think it was like sixty to forty five. And I looked at my new best friend, Steve Jones, and I said, Steve, <laughs> what's, what's going on here? And that's where I actually made the, the box score. Remember the box score always used to have the attendance in it? Well, the attendance for the game, on there was I, my memory is it was like Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday were the three <laughs> games. And there was nobody there. They played in the afternoon. So the attendance on, on Monday was like 125. They actually put that in the box score. And then the next day it was 124. So I said on the air, I said, Steve, what happened to the other guy? You know, I mean, it was just, it was just, 
I'm going, whoa. And, and are that team is one, are you one me big that, 10 game against Northwestern. That Penn State basketball throng that travels so well was not around there. But, but no, they didn't make the – it, it was interesting. That Saturday was the game at Indiana where they had the goal line stand, and Steve and Jeff Tarman drove up to Milwaukee after that, and that kind of turned the program back in the right the direction. Goal again. line stand against Jerry DiNardo's Hoosiers. Right, running up the middle four straight times is my memory. <laughs> with, with, with the offensive coordinator who was – Steve Adazio, former uh, Temple head coach. Uh, he was the off- He was calling those plays. Indeed, running well the stack eye, which was three yeah. backs in a row behind the quarterback, <laughs> one of these you, it, with with seven linemen. It was it was yeah, like but, a perfect yeah. tee like this. But yeah, it, it it did not have a lot of talent. He did not inherit a lot of talent. You know, slowly over time, they obviously got better. Taylor Battle came a few years ago. They won the NIT. A few years later, they won the NIT. It got better, but yeah, those first few years, I remember they played at Illinois. With Illinois had that great team that played for the national title with uh, Darrell Williams, yeah. Luther Head, and all those guys. And I remember at, at halftime, I mean, the game was over. They were down by a million. And I remember talking to Ed after the game, and he was very good friends with uh, with Bruce, the, the, the coach at, at Illinois. And I said, do, do you ever envision a moment where you could have a team like this? And he said, yeah, that's what we're trying to get to. And, and He beat them the next year. I know they I'm beat him at Illinois. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Dick, Dick, how did how did the uh, how did the uh, radio job come about? How how did you get to yeah. become an analyst, and how challenging was that to do yeah. it? Because they were playing they were playing a couple times a week, and you still had a lot of other stuff to do. I mean, yeah, you had to get up to state college. I mean, that's a drive just for the home games. Indeed, yeah. I don't. I don't. Have, the only home games I get are when they play at the Palestra or at Rutgers. Uh, yeah, so, but yes, <laughs> you, you, you're, you're, you are right, Bob. So what happened was. I was still covering the football team in 04, and I went up for a game, and I said, let me go talk to their new coach. Maybe it was 2003. Let me go talk to the new basketball coach. You know, why Why doesn't this work? Why can't this work? So I sat down with Ed DeCellis, and we had a nice conversation, and I, I'm sure I ended up writing a story for the paper about it. And sometime not long after that, I don't think it was Ed, maybe it was Ed, but somebody called me, hey, would you be possibly interested in this? I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. I wasn't going to be able to do it that year. That was the year of the great St. Joe's team, the 03, 04 team. Yeah. That was Ed's first year. I mean, that, that was what I did. I, w- I was there for all of that. Um, but then the next year, maybe a month or so before the season, I believe, I think it was Guido who called me, says, do That's you want to do this? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I said, you know, I always kind of wanted to do this. And I'm thinking, you know, why not? Let's let's see what it's like. Let's give it a shot. I knew Steve a little bit. Steve obviously has become a great friend. And, and Jeff Tarman, who was there with us for years, a great friend as well. And I just found it interesting because after the first couple of games, I said to Steve, I said, well, what happens now? Like when the game is over, he says, well, you leave. I said, what do you mean you leave? I'm supposed to be on my laptop and start writing now. So from that standpoint, it was kind of all I'd learned about basketball and radio and TV, which I'd done a lot of in different mediums. Um, And then it's just like understanding how to get what you want to say in in a quick amount of time. And basketball is better than some other sports because they're you got foul shots. You got the ball coming up the court. You have time to say stuff. But, yeah, that's kind of how it happened. I didn't know that it would go on this long, but it's really been fun. I mean, just to get to know the people and obviously working with Steve, it's just he's one of the best. And he knows all the stuff I don't know. Like he knows the, the 11th guy on the other roster. I'm more looking for nuggets for people, and I'm trying to say, look, here's what I think is going to happen next. I'm very much not the guy who said, hey, that guy just scored a layup. Well, we already know that, right? So what do you think is going to happen? Why is this happening? I'm a kind of a what's next and why guy. And just being around different coaches and different ways they coach and and being in the Big Ten to see the whole Big Ten thing. I'd never never been to those gyms. Uh, And just to see people like – Tom Izzo and and Bo Ryan and guys, I mean, just some of the best at their craft. Uh, it's it's been it's been a lot of fun doing. You remember the time we were in the the bar and told Bo, Bo Ryan that we called his team the Luftwaffe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't remember anything about that, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Bo, Bo, we used to kid Bo all the time about his team because they played a certain way. And, I mean, yeah. they just knocked out people with screens. What was it? Uh, 
what do we call football football on hardwood i mean it was just yeah. it was crazy the there way was they also played a lot of six seven burn yes. cut blonde white guys named Krabenhoft. so <laughs> who's still there and got an altercation <laughs> with joanna howard this year i said i wasn't yeah. surprised it became <laughs> a running joke and yeah. We saw him at a bar someplace. I don't know where <laughs> where the hell we were, but I suppose the Big Ten tournament. And well, it couldn't have been there. It was like football season or something. I don't know where the hell we were. We, yeah, but he. I, I saw him the summer. Remember the famous 36-33 game in the Big Ten tournament in the quarters at Indianapolis? Yes, yes. <laughs> so I see him that summer, and I go, Bo, what was that? And he says, it was Penn State's fault. I said, no, it was your fault. You're, you're the one. Yeah. <laughs> That would, they had played. They had played a game against Illinois a few years earlier that they won thirty eight to thirty three. Yeah, yeah. And when and when the, and Illinois, by the way, did not take a free throw in the game, which is the only game I've ever seen that in my life. And it was a home game for Illinois. I said to Steve after the game, the game was over. I said, "When does the second half start?" <laughs> well, you know, Bo <laughs> might have been right because you didn't even see the worst one out of all that trio. They mm. beat Tennessee forty three forty one in. <laughs> Over time, yeah. a yeah, year before was, you started, or two years it, before you started. It, it was hard to watch, but it was very effective. And, and of course, that, Ohio State to two that, national That games. game ended 33-33 in regulation <laughs> on a clanged dunk by Calvin Booth well, at the, the buzzer. And they the, had to the night, well, Dave, do you remember what we did the night after the night Penn State beat Wisconsin and Indianapolis? We ended up at a bar right down the street on the way back to the hotel. Jeff Tarman was there. You were there. Steve was there. We're watching an NBA game between Orlando and Golden State. They made more threes in that game than these teams scored points. <laughs> it was just wild. And Taylor Battle, that was the night Taylor set the school scoring record. He had a game high nine. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it is Penn State. Maybe they're the problem. And you was maybe what got you to basketball was the six four game against Iowa. Uh, yeah, was that there, was right. The football. I was definitely there for that one. In fact, the next morning, <laughs> I'll never forget this. I called the football office and got Tom Bradley on the phone. I said, Tom. <laughs> Meet me at the waffle shop downtown. You need an intervention. Because <laughs> as you remember, and Dave had the greatest line of that season, and I've repeated this many times, he wrote in the paper, he said, this, this defense is the most unrewarded since the Alamo. And it was <laughs> so true. I mean, that was a truly great defensive team that never allowed more than 21 points the whole season. All year. They, and they finished yeah, four and they, seven. They finished four and nine or whatever it was. It was, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. I, I am. Yeah, I did, I did have breakfast with Tom. I'm going, are you aware that was the score of the first football game ever played between Rutgers and Princeton? <laughs> 135 years before. Exactly. And Michael Bradley said that it sent, set the game back 135 years, which was a pretty good lead, too. Yeah, and, they, and look, they were taking safeties because they were so sure Penn oh, State perfect. couldn't score. Right. To make great. it a two-point game of taking a safety was it was, it was bizarre, for I, sure. My end of my column, I remember that. I, didn't, I never remember the beginning, but I remember the end because I asked <laughs> Michael Robinson, who's in charge of this offense? And you remember he was kind of split in time. I, with yep, the, I do. It was Zach Mills, and he looked down, he looked up, and he goes, God. <laughs> so my last line was, in that case, God help them. Yeah, and, and, was, to, that was the and, to, and to their credit, they came back the next year with a totally revamped offense with Michael Robinson with Michael and Robinson almost went undefeated. Yeah, yeah had and, a great year. And it was – Bob and I were, were talking about the game after the one they blew to Michigan – pretty much because Joe yeah. kind of sphinctered up and, and, you know, Mike, Mike pretty much saved the day and, and had the game won for them. And then mm -hmm. they gave away the touchdown to Manningham at the very end with one second to go. But the next week they went into Illinois and beat Ron Zook, like Crushed them. five to three or something. Yeah, three to yeah. Ten. <laughs> that that was was a, yeah, yeah. They were just out of anger. You know, when a team is that good, yeah. they can just, just get, pissed off and beat the beat the wow. bejesus out of and them. They, and, and they did. Yeah, that was that was a really good team. And that was fun. That was actually they got, they got rid of me the year before and, they, and then they became good again. My man Bernard Fernandez took over the beat. That's that right. the daily Bob, how, how about a few uh, uh, horse yeah. race? At least one horse well, race no, no. question. We well, can't no, have this add, guy without that. 
what I wanted to ask Dick was was this. So what to you uh, is the more exciting environment to work in? Like a triple crown race, whether it's the Derby or the Preakness or you're at Belmont and it's it's somebody's going for the triple crown <laughs> or a final four. Could you just compare like the excitement level and what for you? Yeah, I know I know you like a lot of different things, but what for you is, is the event you you always look most forward to to cover it? So, yeah, it's a great questions, Bob. So for me, I mean, I was really fortunate in that I got to cover my two favorite sports and the seasons perfectly dovetailed. Yeah. Like the uh, college basketball starts in November and would go till the final four in April and the Derby's a month later. So you get mm-hmm. right through the Triple Crown all the way to the Breeders' Cup, which is usually the beginning of November. Which, yeah. And then we start again with college basketball. So from that standpoint, I could not have been any more fortunate. And to work at the place I did – in the time I did where there was actually money to travel and you could do things. I mean, I did 31 Kentucky Derbies in a row, 25 Final Fours. My favorite event and my favorite sport are essentially the same thing. My favorite event is the Breeders' Cup and horse racing because it's the championship. It's the end of the year. It's not nearly as big as the Triple Crown races, and I get it because it's just for people that are really locked in. But it's all the best horses showing up in the same place at the same time. Um, so that's my favorite event. And people say, well, if you you had to cover one sport, college basketball or horse racing, which fortunately I didn't have to worry about that, it would be horse racing for me just because of the stories. Uh, the stories are the greatest at horse racing. I mean, even this year's Kentucky Derby, I mean, come on, 80 to 1, horse isn't even supposed to be in the race. Rich Strike, he gets in the day before. That doesn't happen in any other sport. Uh, and, at, you know, who are these people? That was why I was so disappointing they didn't run in the Preakness because you wanted to get what's the next chapter here. We'll see them in the Belmont Stakes in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just I, I love them both. But, yeah, the Breeders' Cup for me is, yeah. is absolutely my favorite. Yeah. The best Dick, story uh, my, you covered in horse racing, Dick, uh, Smarty, uh, Smarty Jones, Barbaro. The bit- yeah, the, the best the best continuing story. In fact, the best year I ever had in sports writing was two thousand four. So I covered the great St. Joe's team yeah. all the way to all the way to the finish line at the Meadowlands, and literally a month later, I was at the Derby covering Smarty Jones, uh, which also both of them had bad endings. Dave was there with me at the Meadowlands when John Lucas made the shot, and then of course Birdstone catches Smarty Jones at the end of the Belmont. Let's, let's back up. At, let's back up to yeah. halftime of that game and the and the elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that, I said. Dave came point. up to me. Game, are you watching? Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it, one of the few times. It, it, every once in a while, Dave is right. It's so disappointing when that happens. <laughs> it is disappointing. <laughs> so my memory is St. Joe's was ahead maybe by seven at the half or so. And Dave says, you know, Oklahoma State, man, I've watched them. They're really good. Look out. I go, what game are you watching? <laughs> uh, because I thought St. Joe's was faster. They dominated the half. But they really should have been up by 15. They couldn't That's what shot. I said. I said they should be yeah. up by 15. And that's no doubt. Never, yeah, never no, good. you're right. Yeah, yeah never good. That, that, is, that is a fact. But, yeah, then I just went right into St. Joe's. And the toughest story ever, and Dave was involved in this uh, to an extent, too, was Barbaro. Yeah, I mean, he was the – Bob, that was the 2006 Kentucky yeah. Derby. It's by far – the best Kentucky Derby winner I've ever seen live. This horse was awesome. It was really? just a, I didn't know you. Oh my God. That. Barbara yeah. won by six and a half lengths. Yeah. It, it, if you keep watching after the race ends, he's 20 lengths in front by the first turn. It was just one of these awe inspiring performances. I think you can make a case. It's the greatest Derby since secretary in 73. That's how good he was. And then of course he comes to Pimlico, the first 200 yards of the race is uh, right rear leg gets shattered and yeah. everybody knows the rest of the story. But yeah, I covered that all the way from the middle of May until January when Dr. Richardson, who was such a great spokesman for the veterinary business and everything else, said, look, we always said we were going to do this if the horse was in pain. And that was the point where they had to euthanize him. But, uh, yeah, just a, an amazing and, – and for readers, I think that was probably the story, maybe two that I did in my whole career. That story really caught readers because I think everybody can identify. Yeah, Everybody's had a yeah. pet at their home. Yeah. They can all identify with it. I got incredible email on that one. And the other one I got incredible email was near the end. My last, uh, I, I got out of the Daily News December of 2017. Uh, in, I want to say February of 2015, I did a 25-year anniversary story on, on Hank Gathers. And right. his death for Loyola Marymount, of course, he played at Dobbins Tech with Bo Kimball, 
Doug Overton was on his team. I mean, just the, one of the greatest high school teams in Philadelphia history. But when I went back and did that retrospective 25 years later, the reaction was incredible. Uh, it was just, I, I think I may have gotten more emails on that story than any I ever did. That was reminiscent of the one you did on Jameer Nelson back in Chester. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just that that's th those kinds of stories. People just, they, I mean, I love to write them. I remember when, when uh, Chuck Bousman, who was our sports editor at the time, he said, hey, look, I want you to do something on this. I'm thinking, boy, this is going to be hard. And you know where I, I visited? The first place I went was his grave site, which is about a mile west of the Philadelphia airport. And then I just started going places where he'd been, his school, and where the funeral was. And the next thing you know, the story just builds and builds, and then you go ahead and write it. If you if you show people that you give a damn, they don't really care who you are, and you're somebody to them anyway. You're part of Philadelphia journalism elite, and then you show up, then they're they're gonna they're gonna talk to somebody like you. It, I I remember I had no idea what North Philadelphia was. It's 1990. It's March, and I just I've only been in in Pennsylvania for seven months, and I decide. I'm going to drive over there on the off. It didn't happen on the off day in, in, during an 8 10 tournament. There, there wasn't any off day. It was one of the days of the tournament. You talking about the funeral? You talking about the funeral day? No, I'm talking about the day he died. Gathered. So, so he, he died on a Sunday night. Uh, it was at the 8 10 tournament that was going on. I was actually in Albany with the great LaSalle team with Lionel Simmons. Uh, the only game they had lost all year was to Loyola Marymount at the Philadelphia yeah. Civic Center. Yeah. And everybody knew Hank because they were most of the South's team was in the Philadelphia Public League and either played with him or against him. That was a brutal night because I got word. I mean, this is way before cell phones, right? So I got somebody called me from the office on the press phone in the Albany Civic Center and told me about it. So, I mean, I, I didn't write much about the game at that point. Uh, but, yeah, it was the semifinals of their conference tournament. Uh, Dick, yeah. uh, I, just to Go change ahead. gears real quick, I just yep. wanted to ask you any thoughts on – where horse racing's going with uh, some of the problems that it's had uh, and some of the trainers that have uh, famous trainers that are not really around as much anymore. And also, do you have any thoughts at all on the Belmont? Is it weird not having Bob Baffert around? Do you, is it, I mean, is it bad? Is it good? What, what do you think? Yeah, it, it is weird not having him around because he's the face of the sport. Now I'm, I'm probably in the minority on this, Bob, but I think that the powers that be in the sport made a dreadful mistake in deciding to uh, single out Bob Baffert as the bad guy in the sport. It would be like Adam Silver saying LeBron James is the bad guy. It's not something you should do. Basically, what he was accused of and ultimately technically found guilty of was horse racing's version of jaywalking. Uh, he was not doping horses. Uh, there was no performance enhancers involved, but they were irritated with him. And I get it that it happened after the Kentucky Derby, which is the biggest event in the sport. So they decided to, quote, make an example of him. I just think, I just think they picked the wrong circumstance to do that. Are there bad people who have done bad things in this sport? Absolutely. One of them is a guy named George Navarro is in jail right now, and he should be in jail. I mean, that, he was doing that. It's on tape. It's obvious he's doing it. Those are the kind of people you want out of the game. But, yeah, I think they made a mistake uh, singling out Baffert. Uh, look, I mean, the guy's won two triple crowns. Now, unfortunately for him, he's become Lance Armstrong to the public. Everybody thinks he's a bad guy, and I'm not sure how he gets his reputation back. Yeah. Well, um, before we leave, the, the one sport you're still involved in in the public eye is Penn State basketball because you're on the radio with Steve all the time. Yep. You talk about a perfect pair. It is what you said. You complement each other just perfectly. You guys should be doing the radio on, in Kentucky basketball. <laughs> I don't know what – if you even know what your listenership is, but it's like this hidden gem of, of a, a telecast, a, a broadcast – that I don't know how many people hear, but it's it's wonderful. It's a perfect meshing of one guy saying what he has to say, the other guy getting out of the way. It, it's not like you're afraid of dead air. It's just that both guys have something to say and say it quickly, concisely, and tell you what you want to know, not what you already know. And that, that's that's a cool thing about it. Well, I, I appreciate that. Look, it's great work with Steve because he's the ultimate pro, and we kind of look at it as having a conversation about the game. And we've been very lucky, obviously. Some of the players that we've gotten to know, I mean, Taylor Battle's a close friend, just really good people uh, through the years that, you know, Jamel Corley, I mean, just 
really up up to the present day. I mean, from from Ed and then Patrick Chambers and his staff and Micah and Adam Fisher and that group, they're just really good people. And I was fat last year. You know, Mike was obviously dealt a difficult hand when he walked in there. I learned a lot of basketball last year, and I told him that on our last broadcast. I always enjoy learning more about the game, and he has a unique perspective, and I think Penn State fans can can look forward to you – know, obviously, he's got to get players, and the, and the whole world has changed with the NIL and the transfer portal and everything else, but – Feel confident you're in good hands with a guy who really understands how to coach basketball. They did it one way two years ago in 2020 with serious players. They had serious yes, they players, did. and yep. that team won eight games in a row. And <laughs> if if they don't get some bad breaks with two guys late in the year, especially Myron Jones, who had uh, mononucleosis, and then uh, I don't know what was wrong with Lamar Stevens. Uh, he might have been just hurt a little bit more than no, he let on. But they could have won that league with that Indeed. team. Now, yeah, I, last year you had a, a guy who did so much with so little. Uh, and I think he's going to keep doing that moving forward because I wouldn't say that Purdue ever has the most players. They have talent, uh, but that's, the, that's the, the shop that he's learned it. He's learned how to X and O for certain, and he showed it last year. Yeah, and look, watch the Boston Celtics. They'll be in the NBA Finals. Who was one of the top assistants that helped Jason Tatum and Brown along the way? Micah Shrewsbury. He was right there with Brad Stevens. And, yeah, I, obviously you need players. You're right, Dave. That 2020 team was incredibly talented. Uh, I had told people before the season, this because they lost so many. Remember, they all lost all those close games the year before. I said, this is going to be a really, really good team. You told yeah, I think they would have booked tickets for the, the NCAA tournament, and then, of course, they couldn't have one. Yeah, no, it was just that 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 was the team that never really had a chance to show people how ultimately good they were. But yeah, they were incredibly good and to win eight Big Ten games in a row. And you're right about last year, the team with all the transfers and everything. But the fact that they just kept getting better and better and they were so competitive with not as much talent, obviously, as some of the other teams, they just were offensively challenged. But the coach the staff and the players, and especially a guy like John Harrah, kept them in games that they probably shouldn't have been at. So we'll see what happens in the future. And John Harrah at the end of the season said in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. this this team is going to win the Big Ten. I mean, that kind of shocked everybody. He meant it because he believed yeah. in Micah Shrewsbury. Yeah, no, I think, again, to, if, if you watched it and saw how much better that team got – from say Christmas time to like mid to late January, it was like a revelation because you were wondering if they were going to get to double digits and wins and how many Big Ten games they could they could win. But I think there was only three or four games all year they were not competitive in. Uh, and again, they had to play maybe not like the coach wants to play. I know he wants to play faster, but that's just about getting more talent in, yeah. in the program. And, yeah. and we'll see. He didn't want to play like this anyway. No. We will yeah. be you, you the. the the foreseeable future, you're going to be doing this job. You're not giving up. You're not yeah, no, I mean, I, I, hey, man, I, I, I like being around the game, and it's, it's a great way to be around the game. And to and look, I've known Adam Fisher since he was the, the head manager when I first started. To see a guy like Adam now become the associate head coach, that's the cool thing about being around college sports. You just see players develop, coaches develop, and it's definitely, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, right. how they do. You're in this year. for the long haul then. We, we hope so, because that's, <laughs> uh, that's how I want to see. I don't know about the horsies, but I know about this. I'm in that for the long haul too. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Dick, you're fabulous as always. And really I appreciate you. Some great stories and we appreciate you having, having you on. You got it. Thanks guys.